Hello again everybody and today I'm going to continue with my uh, Northern Britain theme, uh, this time not quite on Hadrian's Wall but nearly, so I'm going to talk about the site of Vindolanda, once called Chesterholm, now known by its proper Roman name of Vindolanda. It's a Roman auxiliary fort in Northumberland. It was occupied from the first century AD and it continued to be occupied more or less until the end of the Roman occupation of Britain at the end of the 4th, early 5th century. It's a remarkable site because of the unusual geographical conditions, some of which I shall explore in a bit. It predates Hadrian's Wall, which I've been talking about for the last three days, by at least 40 years, perhaps slightly longer. But it has some of the most amazing archaeological finds uh, from anywhere within the Roman Empire. So first of all, what's the difference between auxiliaries and legionaries? Well, legionaries were Roman citizens and auxiliaries weren't. At the end of their period of service, auxiliaries would hope to get grant of Roman citizenship, but they're not Roman citizens, so they come from places uh, elsewhere. In the case of Vindolanda, the first lot of people we know who were there were the first cohort of Tungrians, who came from what's now Belgium. Then they were con uh, succeeded by Batavians, who came from Holland, and then the Tungrians came back. And there's a succession of other people, uh, but none of them were Roman citizens uh, when they were at Vindolanda. Um, for a period before Hadrian's Wall was occupied, it was uh, a military base and it was part of the occupation forces of Northern Britain. When Hadrian's Wall was built, um, the, the fortress at Vindolanda became less important because just a few miles to the north there was the fortress of Housesteads, Vercovicium. And so some of the soldiers from Vindolanda were moved forward to be actually on the wall uh, at uh, Housesteads, but some people nonetheless continued to uh, stay at Vindolanda. When Housesteads was abandoned and the, wall, uh, the, the frontier moved forward to the Antonine Wall in Scotland, uh, it still continued to be occupied and by this time there's some evidence of some civilian settlement growing up outside uh, the original Roman auxiliary fort. When the fortress was uh, it, it had another rebirth around uh, the beginning of the 3rd century when the wall was reinforced, rebuilt under Septimius Severus. It seems there was a good deal of campaigning, which usually means there was a lot of uh, rebellion. Roman soldiers, Roman army came to sort it all out. Uh, Severus was here, the Roman emperor. He actually died in York in 211 AD. Uh, his successor, his son, Caracalla and his brother Geta, who was murdered fairly shortly, uh, didn't stay in Britain very long. Maybe they bought off the local tribes. Either way, uh, there was a period of more or less established uh, sort of peace uh, right, right throughout the 3rd century. And it's during that time that the uh, civilian settlement, which is called the Vicus, uh, the village if you like, um, uh, if you think of the English word uh, vicinity, it comes from Wikini, the people who lived in the Wikus, uh, that, that really developed and some of the most exciting finds come from that period as well as earlier. But what makes uh, Vindolanda so interesting is not the spectacular nature of it. It's actually the very ordinariness of it, the very everyday evidence which occurs, uh, which we find. And that comes about because of its unusual geography. It's a very wet place. Some parts of the site are entirely waterlogged, which means that anything that's in the ground doesn't decompose in the way that it might normally do if it was organic material. That's because it's anoxic. So there's no oxygen there, so stuff simply doesn't uh, decompose. There's been um, uh, some amazing things found there. Um, shoes, uh, leather soles of shoes with hobnails still in. The remains of a dog uh, with its fur still intact. Uh, some Roman boxing gloves were found in 2007, uh, 2017. Two gloves, but apparently not a pair, so uh, there was at least uh, another pair somewhere else uh, similar uh, to those. The skull of a beheaded victim, probably uh, a rebellious Briton was found uh, and it had been stuck on a spike. It was quite common for, at the end of a battle uh, for troops to take heads um, as, uh, as like a trophy and then display them. And that seems to have been what happened there. A very beautiful silver brooch in sort of in the design of an elegant duck. 
uh, and uh, even a wooden, the remains of a wooden toilet seat, so surely one of the greatest inventions ever of mankind. But the biggest and most amazing finds were letters. Uh, a, a large cache of these were found, uh, ink on wood, uh, and those were found on, in 1992, and another cache of these was found in 2017. And I'm going to talk a uh, bit more detail about those in the next talk. One of the unusual things about Vinterlander as a site is that it's actually privately owned. Um, and this meant, has meant, when it was bought, first of all, in the 1930s by an archaeologist called Eric Burley, and it's remained in his family ever since. Um, and that has uh, had the effect that it's not been subject uh, to uh, the slings and arrows of fashions in academia. It's just one family which has had generations of archaeologists in it who've continued to excavate the site and look after it very well. Um, and so that's been a great boon over the years. It means it's got a crisis at the moment because it's closed because of uh, the lockdown means it can't have any visitors and it can't have its usual cadre of uh, volunteers who pay to learn how to be archaeologists and then to work on the site during the summer months. So let's hope that uh, a way is found through this fi current financial crisis and that Vindolanda will continue to be the brilliant site that it has been in the past and hopefully will be in the future. And more on the letters tomorrow.